just going to read the opening 15 verses of the psalm, Psalm 50. Psalm of Asaph. Asaph, you may know, was one of the musicians, choir leaders, if you like to use modern terminology, worship leaders in the temple in the time of David and Solomon, and a number of the psalms are attributed to him. The Mighty One, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes, he does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire, around him a mighty tempest. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my faithful ones, who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your foes. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls? or drink the blood of goats. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High. And call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Amen. This is God's word. We know he will bless it to our hearts today. Will you join with me in a short word of prayer? Father, we pray that you will speak with the power of the Spirit through the Word to our hearts today. We know what we need to hear. We know what we need to receive. And we come to us, Lord, with abundant grace for us in all our times of need. So now, Lord, we pray. We would say in the words of young Samuel, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Grant unto us, Lord, that listening ear and that receptive heart. For we know that what you have to say today will do us good. We ask it in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. The text of Scripture I want to leave with you this morning, I think is a familiar one, I'm sure, to most, if not all, of the service today. It is verse 15 of Psalm 50. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. This particular verse is really a sample of many other such verses which contain encouragements for us to pray to the Lord. I think all of us recognize how much we need to be encouraged to pray. We know that our flesh is averse naturally to prayer. We know that the devil fears the prayers of God's people. In the words of the poet and hymn writer William Cooper, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. For if there is one thing that the devil knows and probably knows better than we do, is that there is a power when God's people are in touch with God. There is a power not in the act of prayer itself, the power is in the Lord, but it is through the prayers of God's people that that needed power is channeled down in grace into our everyday lives and into all of the necessities of our life. And so this contains, uh, this, this verse contains an encouragement for us to pray. And as I've said, it's simply just a sample of many other such verses which I'm sure would readily come to mind where God exhorts his people and encourages his people and might even say entices his people to come and to breathe out their wants and requests and burdens to him. This particular sample is simple. There's nothing very difficult for us to understand. It's very straightforward for us. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will glorify me. Of course, the question we have to ask right off the bat is this. To whom is this particular command 
and consolation address. What is the scope of this verse? You know, we have a little chorus which sounds very spiritual when we first hear it sung, but actually it is erroneous. And it goes something like this. Every promise in the book is mine, every chapter and every line. Well, that sounds very nice, but it actually isn't true. Every promise in the book is not ours. Some promises are restricted by their very context. Some are made to sinners. Some are made to believers. Some are made to the church. Some are made to Israel as a nation. Some are made to men. Some are made to women. Some are made to parents. Some are made to children. So every promise in the book is not ours. But that doesn't mean that we are in any way impoverished. The Bible says in the words of St. Peter that God has given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these we might be made partakers of the divine nature. There is a multitude of promises given to us as God's people in the scriptures and we can say without any fear of contradiction that this is one of them. How do I know? If you look in the context, yeah, look up the chapters, uh, Psalm 50, and look at verse 5, for example. He says, gather to me my faithful ones. This is, to, this is the ones to whom he is speaking. And then he says in verse 7, hear my people, and I will speak. And he says, O Israel, I will testify against you. And you say, aha, but here's the promise that is made to Israel. But I want you to remember this morning that you and I, according to St. Paul in his letter to the Galatians, that we by faith are the children of Abraham. We are his spiritual seed. And though we are not naturally of Israel as a nation, we are certainly the children of Abraham by faith in Jesus Christ. We are, in the words of Galatians, the Israel of God. And so therefore we can say, here's a, here's a word to us. You can say this as an individual. Christian this morning, here's a word from God for me, for me today. Call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver you and you will glorify me. Just four simple thoughts, points. As I say, this is nothing terribly uh, complex about this verse. It's straightforward and simple. We're going to look first of all at the period of which he speaks. He calls it the day of trouble. And secondly, we're going to look at the prescription that he gives. Call upon me in the day of trouble. And then we're going to look at the promise that he issues. Call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver, or as the word that can also be translated, I will rescue you. And finally, we're going to look at the product of all of this. When we call upon the, day, the Lord in the day of trouble and he delivers us, what's going to happen as a result? He says, you will glorify me. So there's the, there's the outline, four simple words, the period, the prescription, the promise, and the product. First of all, the period. He speaks of the day of trouble. It's interesting when you go through the Bible, and I was doing this actually yesterday as I was meditating on the message for today, how often this expression, especially in the Old Testament, is used, the day of trouble of trouble. For example, David said in the Psalms, in the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. We will look at uh, other verses as we go on, but you find this occurring over and over and over again. And it's occurring in the language of people who are believers, eminent believers, inspired to write the Holy Scriptures, and they are referring to days of trouble, specifically their trouble. As I said already, David said, in the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. And we know, of course, the great Psalm 46, which is the basis of Luther's great hymn, A Mighty Fortress, which begins, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in what? In trouble. So the Lord is allowed to say about trouble and times of trouble. Of course, when he talks about the day of trouble, he's not literally talking about 24-hour period. This is just a kind of expression which refers to a time or a season of trouble. The word trouble can literally also be translated distress. So here's a word from God for us as God's people at such, an, at such a time as this. A period of distress, a period of trouble. I'm 
and we can immediately see that the people of God, the Lord's own people, the one whom he defended, defines as his faithful ones, or if you're using the King James Bible, verse 5, it says, gather my saints together unto me. So he defines these people to whom he's speaking as his saints, his faithful ones, his people, the Israel of God, the entirety of all of those who know Christ and are ever will know Christ, and he's speaking to them about times of trouble. What is the inference? Simply this, that Christians in their lives will have days of trouble. Good Christians will not be exempt from times of trouble. And why is that? Why is it that these seasons are to be expected by us? You remember when Peter wrote his epistle, and of course he was writing in a particular context, but he was writing to Christians who were suffering very severe persecution for their faith. And he said to them, do not think it strange. Do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial that is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Don't be amazed at this. Don't think it shouldn't happen. This is something rather that we should expect. We're going to expect and we need to expect days of trouble. Why? Well, very simply, because we live in a world that's broken. We live in a, we live in a world that is still experiencing the effects of the fall back in Genesis chapter 3. Paul speaks as he writes to the Romans, I think it's the 8th chapter when he talks, he uses a word frequently, he talks about groaning, talks about us groaning within ourselves, talks about the Spirit of God groaning within us. He also talks about creation growing, groaning. The whole creation is groaning. Why? Because the shalom of Eden, that word shalom that we almost often find translated in the Bible as peace, which certainly includes that, but it's more than that. It speaks of everything working together in harmony. And all of that harmony, that shalom, was fractured by the entrance of sin. Man was affected by it in every respect. He was affected by it spiritually. He became lost. He became dead in sin. And not only was he affected spiritually, he was, a, he was affected physically. The cells of his body began to die. That's an ongoing process, by the way, for us. We, we are dying creatures. That's why we experience sicknesses. That's why we will eventually die physically. All of this is a result of the entrance of sin into the world. The world around us is completely broken. Just, if you want, evidence of that. Just listen very briefly to one short uh, news bulletin on any channel you like and you will hear evidences of the brokenness of this world in which we live. The evidences of the effects of sin are everywhere. And we as the people of God, though born of his spirit and washed in his blood, though made partakers of the divine nature as we saw when we looked at the series, on the fruit of the Spirit, we still have our flesh, our sinful flesh, the flesh of which Paul said in me, that is in my flesh, there dwells no good thing. And there it fights, it fights against the Spirit. It contends against the will of the Holy Ghost who abides within us. And so we say to you today, we can expect days of trouble. The problem, the, the, the trouble can come in various forms. It can come, obviously, as we've said, in our physical bodies. You know, we expect, a, 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 most people expect us to deal with, you know, what we call, you know, the minor ailments of life. We get colds and sniffles and coughs and all of that. But sometimes we get a, we, we get a message that, you know, is, is much more solemn than that, is much more serious than that. And whether it comes for ourselves or comes from someone that we know, this is a day of trouble. And I don't think we could uh, classify it in any other way than that. It's a day of trouble. Sometimes it comes not in our physical bodies, but in our financial situations. We struggle to pay the bills. We live from paycheck to paycheck. We wonder how we're going to make it through. And we find the stress of this. And the difficulty that comes, sometimes it comes 
not only in the physical body or in the financial situation, but in the family relationships. And we have all, I'm sure, uh, known experiences of this, even within our families. Divisions and rifts and uh, all kinds of difficulties going on. Sadly, it can even come in the fellowship of the believer. And many of the epistles of the New Testament were written to churches that were dealing with uh, factions and divisions and strife and all of that. And those are, those are days of trouble. Those are days of trouble. The Lord Jesus made a statement on one occasion, something to this effect. He says, it is impossible, but that offenses will come. Offenses will come. And when they come, and they come, as it were, on the dark cloud, that creates trouble. It is a day of trouble. Sometimes we must, as we think about this period, we say these periods are not only to be expected, sometimes these periods can be extreme. Extreme. You turn across very just very quickly to Paul's second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 1. And Paul, the apostle, is talking about his own, his own conflicts, what he refers to in this chapter as his own afflictions, his own times of trouble. He says, for example, uh, in verse 8, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. Now listen to the intensity and the extremity of this. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Now this is Paul speaking. This is a man who walked with God, who wrote under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, was a chosen apostle of God. And yet he confesses that in the midst of his infliction, affliction, they were of such an intensity and of such an extremity, he says that we were burdened beyond our strength and that we despaired even of life. He goes on to say, indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. My friends, that's extreme. I think you would have to agree. And sometimes our afflictions, our days of trouble come because of the very extremity of the situation. We thought about Paul. We think of Israel at the Red Sea. They had been liberated from Egypt. And if you look very carefully at your map, and you notice the way that the Lord brought the children of Israel out. And actually they were coming in between two ranges of mountains. And when they came in between these two ranges of mountains, they find the Red Sea is in front of them. They're in a cul-de-sac. They're trapped. And behind them is coming the Egyptian army, intent on butchering the people of God. I think you'll have to agree that that's an extreme situation, is it not? And sometimes extreme situations come into our lives. Think of the time of King Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And an enemy army of Zerah the Ethiopian, a quarter of a million strong, has invaded the tiny nation of Judah. The nation of Israel today, modern Israel, is only about the size of the principality of Wales in the United Kingdom. Very small geographical area. But back in those days, we're not talking about the entire uh, geographical nation. We're talking about just the nation of Judah, very tiny. And so you can imagine that when a quarter of a million enemy soldiers enter the land, it's like a plague of locusts. And Jehoshaphat says to the Lord as he calls the people to pray, he said, Lord, we have no might at all against this great company that comes against us. And we don't know what to do. Now there's a confession of extremity. We haven't got the wherewithal to face the enemy. We haven't got the wisdom even to know how to go about this. Friends, listen, there are such occasions will come to pass even in the experiences of the people of God. That word experience then I want to take up because we've said that the period, the day of trouble can be expected. It can be extreme. But how do we experience it? Now, if we're going to be honest, if I am going to be honest with you and talk about the days of trouble, so often my experience and reaction to that is one of dread or fear. 
what's tomorrow going to bring? And uh, I don't know about you, but I have uh, this tendency which I need to fight so often, and that is for my mind to go to the most extreme uh, situation, uh, the worst case scenario. And so often fear fills our hearts. And so often not only fear fills our hearts, but our faith gets shaken. Because, you know, we read in the Word of God that our God is good, that our God is our Father, that our God is kind and gentle and so on and so forth. Oh, that's true. And we know that in the words of the psalm, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those that fear him, for he knows our frame and he remembers that we are thus. And then we're faced with some extreme day of trouble. And we find it hard to reconcile our experience with what we have learned about God and his compassion to his people. And very often Satan will take advantage of that and he will say to us, there you have it. God's not the good God that you thought he was. Why would he allow such a thing to happen? Or he may say to you, maybe he is a good God and he's promised to be good to his children. But if, if this is happening to you, maybe you're not one of his children. So you can see the, the, the subtlety, you can hear the hiss of the serpent as he stands out there in the wings, trying in the midst of all of our trouble to make matters worse by causing us to doubt either the character of our God or our relationship with him. And sometimes it goes from fear to faithlessness to what we call, uh, what is translated in Scripture, this word in the King James Bible, is fainting. We faint. And the word faint, as it is used, especially in the Old Testament, simply means to lose heart, to despair, to throw up your hands and say, nothing can be done. There's no way through, there's no way out. And we, as it were, curl up in the fetal position and we can succumb to that dreadful feeling of despair. Now all of this, all of this I say brothers and sisters, we're talking reality here. They say in New York, let's do real talk. Let, let's, not, let's not talk here in, in, in pseudo spirituality. This is real life. This is real life and it's real life for the Christian. We do have, we have had, or we will have our days of trouble. We can expect them, they can be extreme, and we can anticipate that as we experience them so often, fear and faithfulness, faithlessness and fainting will be our response. What do we do? Jehoshaphat said to the Lord, we have no power against this great company that comes against us. Neither we have. The paltry numbers of the tiny Judean army were no match at all for the two, that quarter of a million soldiers of Zero the Ethiopian. He said, Lord, we don't know what to do. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful that at a time like that, the Lord tells us what to do? And here it is in this verse. Here's his prescription. What do you do on the day of trouble? He says, call upon me. Call upon me in the day of trouble. No matter how extreme that situation might be, call upon me in the day of trouble. Of trouble. You say, I don't know what to do. Thank God the Lord will tell you what to do. And inevitably and invariably what he says in his word is bring this situation, however grievous it is, however impossible it is, however extreme it is, bring it to me. I love the old chorus that we used to sing, where can I go but to the Lord? And thank God the way is open for us. God has given us the warrant, the authority of his own command. He says, come to me, call upon me. And if God gives you that command, that command is your right. That command is your authority. You can go to the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. Why are you there? Because you called me, Lord. You told me to come. Your command is my authority. And if he has given us the warrant, we can experience a welcome. We know he'll not drive us away. Why would he call us to call upon him? if he had no intention of listening, if he had no intention of bowing down his ear to hear the groaning that cannot be uttered, if he had no intention of reaching out his mighty arms of power and grace to help us.
call upon me in the day of trouble. And let's remember who is saying this. Go back to the very first words of the psalm. The mighty one, God the Lord, speaks. That who's saying, that's who's saying this. The mighty one, God the Lord. You'll notice there in your Bible that the word Lord is written in entire capitals. That means that in the Hebrew language, it's the word Yahweh, or the word Jehovah, as some would prefer. And that's the word that is used in Scripture to teach us that God is omnipotent, that God is self-existent, that God is unchanging, and that God is the covenant-keeping God of his people. This is the one who says, call upon me. Call upon me in the day of trouble. What can we infer from the very fact that the Lord is telling his people in their day of trouble to call upon him? Well, we can infer, first of all, that he is cognizant. He knows, he's aware of where we're at and what we're going through. Sometimes we don't know that ourselves. Sometimes we are ignorant of the full extent of all of the difficulty that we face. We can only see a part of it. God can see it all. He can see it all. There's a word that is used in the Gospel of John by our Lord Jesus Christ concerning his flock, his sheep, and every one of them. And, it's, and it's, it's, we could go past it so easily and so quickly, but when we meditate upon it, how full it is of great comfort for our souls. He says, I know my sheep. He knows us. He knows everything about us. And he knows what we're at and what we're experiencing and what we're feeling. He can diagnose as the great physician exactly the, the full extent of the trouble of our souls. He is cognizant. He knows it fully. He knows it perfectly because he is the God who knows, as Scripture says, the end from the beginning. The God from whom nothing is hidden. All things are naked and open, says the Scriptures, before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So the Lord is cognizant when we're in the day of trouble. He looks down on us and he'll say to us, I know. In the book of Exodus, when the Lord appeared to Moses that the bush should burn and was not consumed, you know what he said to Moses about the people in Israel? He says, I know their sorrows. I know their sorrows. He knows. But it's one thing to know and be cognizant, it's another thing to care. But the one who says, call upon me, does so because he's not only cognizant of where we're at, but because he has compassion on us in our need. Oh, isn't this a beautiful thought for us to just pause and think about this morning? Our Lord Jesus, in the days of his earthly, his earthly ministry, how powerfully and how continually he revealed his compassion. He did it for the sick. He did it for the suffering. He did it for the sorrowing. Yes, and he even did it for the sinful. Compassion and care. And here the Lord is talking about his own people. The people whom he loves. The people for whom Jesus suffered, shed his blood in sacrifice and died upon the cross of Calvary. The one of uh, the people of whom he said, I have loved you with an everlasting love. These are the very same people that the psalmist spoke of when he said, as the Father has compassion on his children, the Lord has compassion on those that fear him. Brothers and sisters, today we belong to a God who looks upon us with compassion in our troubles. Compassion. There's a beautiful verse over in Hebrews chapter 4. And it says this in verse 15 concerning our Lord Jesus as the high priest. It says, we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. But one who was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And because that is true, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You can flip those words right in verse 15 when it says, we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched 
We can say what he is emphasizing is this. We do have a high priest who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. One who was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Friends, Jesus understands where we're at. Jesus shares with us in our sorrow and in our, and in our darkness and in our day of trouble. If anyone knew what it was to walk through trouble, was it not the Savior? You know, from the very time of his birth, his life was at risk. His Herod sent his butchers to Bethlehem to kill the boys under two years old. And right throughout his life until eventually they nailed him to an old rugged cross. That same cross that manifests how much the Lord understands of what it is to suffer is the same cross that reveals to us how much he cares. Because why was he there? Why was he hanging on that cross? Where was he be why was he bearing shame and scoffing rude friends today? It was because he loved us and he would rather die than let us perish. Let us not for one moment in the midst of all of our trouble begin to doubt the compassion of our God, the compassion of our Savior. Let us never be tempted to say, as the disciples said when the storm was raging, Lord, do you care that we do not care that we are perishing? Yes, Jesus cares. He cared so much that he died in our place. And having done that most extreme act of self-sacrifice, will he abandon us now? In the day of trouble, oh, his compassion is still the same. He knows our sorrows. And his prescription is, bring it to me. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I know where you're at. I know what you're going through. I know what you're feeling. And I care. My heart beats with compassion towards you, a compassion that will never fail and will never falter. And we can not only infer from this command or prescription, call upon me, that he is cognizant of our need and compassionate towards our need, but that he is in control of all things. All oh, friends today, what would be the point in the Lord telling us in our day of trouble to call upon him if he could do absolutely nothing about it? No, the very reason why he tells us to call upon him is because he's the only one who can do anything about it. I was struck this morning, I was looking again through Psalm 107, and you can read this up in your own time, but it gives a situation after situation after situation where people were brought to an end of themselves. In fact, it talks about people being brought to their wit's end. And when they're brought to their wit's end, they call out to the Lord in their trouble, and he answers them. Isn't it, isn't it a sad reality, friends? And as I say, you may have gathered, I'm very much preaching to my own heart this morning, as well as to yours. Isn't it a sad reality that it is only at times when we are at our wit's end, when we know we have no power, when we know we have the wisdom to know what to do, that we then turn to the Lord. But even when that's the case, and the Lord knows that's the case, he will not reject us, he will not refuse us, he will welcome us with gentleness into his arms, into his court, and he will listen with the heart of a compassionate father. So you have the period, the day of trouble, you have the prescription, call upon me, and then thirdly, you have the promise. Call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver you. Or, as we say, it is the word deliver can mean rescue. I will rescue you. Oh, we're beginning to get a little, a little bit of light of hope here, are we not? In our day of trouble. God has said, call upon me. Fine, we call upon the Lord. In our weakness, with our stumbling words and our lack of being able to articulate what we're thinking or feeling, never mind. Jesus understands. And then he says, if you call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver you. A very simple, a very simple thought to counteract the devil's lie, and it's this. That prayer is not a vain thing. Prayer is not a futile exercise. 
Prayer is not simply going through a little bit of psychological therapy to help you to feel better. The great C.H. Spurgeon, the Baptist minister of the 19th century in London, he preached a sermon on prayer, and the title of his, prayer, of his sermon was Prayer is Certified of Success. Prayer is Certified of Success. Now, I need only to say that, that for you to recognize today that that's something that the devil will challenge repeatedly. What's the point? What's the point? Will often come through our minds. And he can, the, the devil, whatever he is, he's not stupid. He'll know how to use the circumstance and he'll know how to use all the nice theological sounding arguments to try and persuade us. And he will try to persuade us. Remember who he is. He is the father of lies, Jesus said. And that's all he does. He lies and he lies and he lies. He can't help himself. He is a compulsive liar. And one of the things that he lies most about is the character of our God and the truthfulness of his word. And he who is the father of lies tries to convince us that our father, our heavenly father, is like him, that he is a liar. Well, my friends, this morning, hey, we know it is even blasphemous to think that way, but nevertheless, the doubt enters the mind, doesn't it? The thought enters the heart. Listen to these words from Isaiah 45 and 19. The Lord is speaking to his people. Isaiah 45, 19, he said this. I did not say to the offspring of Jacob, seek me in vain. God never says seek me in vain. You will not seek the Lord in vain. Prayer is not futile. Prayer is not a useless exercise, a mere religious empty ritual. The prayer is, as Spurgeon said, certified of success. Peter said, God is not slow concerning his promise. He will accept us. And he will answer us. This is the truth of God we're talking about here this morning. This is God speaking. It is impossible for God to lie, the Bible says. Well, here's the statement. Do we believe it or do we not? Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will rescue you. I will rescue you. Now, I know the questions that are coming up in your mind. Okay. You have said that God has called us to call upon him. And to call upon him in the day of trouble. And that God has given us this assurance that if we do call upon him in the day of trouble, that he will rescue us. Now, I'm sure that many of you are starting to think this morning, well, wait a minute. I've been in days of trouble, and I've asked God to do this or to do that, and it hasn't happened. How do I square that experience with this promise? Okay, well, that's a very good question. The question comes down to this. What is the nature of this deliverance? What is the nature of this rescue that the Lord guarantees that he will bring if we call upon him in the day of trouble? If you go through your Bible, read it very carefully, you will discover this, among many other things, that the Bible has detailed for us, recorded for us, a whole series of divine deliverances. A whole series of divine rescues. God is always making himself uh, clearly out as the deliverer and the rescuer of his people. But, if you look at each and every one of them, you'll discover that the manner of his deliverance and the moment at which he delivers vary, vary considerably. Let me show you this. I talked earlier on about Jehoshaphat. He was a godly king of Judah. He was invaded by the enemy armies of the Ethiopians here. He confesses to God, I don't know what to do. We have no might at all against this great company, but our eyes are upon you. All right, the Lord says, gather your army together. Go out to meet the enemy, ahead of the army. We're going to put, of all things, uh, not tanks and artillery, but a choir. A choir of Levites and priests. And they will play on their instruments and they will sing. Give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. I don't think every any military commander ever uh, devised such a plan as that. But out they went. And you know what happened? 
When they got to the encampment of the Ethiopians, God had already acted. And God had caused them to turn their swords once one against another. And there was no battle at all for Jehoshaphat to fight. That's a deliverance, is it not? That's a rescue. You, you know, God can do that. He can, he can take away that which is the source of our trouble. He can still the storm as he did for the, for the, 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 uh, the disciples when they were so terrified of being drowned in the lake of Galilee. The Lord can do that. But the interesting thing in Scripture is this. He doesn't always act in that way. His ways are various. Let me refer you to another instance. The, the Israelites at the Red Sea. There they are in the cul-de-sac. They're trapped. Mountains on the right, mountains on the left. The Egyptian army is behind them and the Red Sea is in front of them and they panic. And you'll remember the words of Moses. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. So what did the Lord do? He took away the Red Sea. No, he didn't. But he made a way through it. And sometimes the Lord does that for us, brothers and sisters. That which appears to us to be the cause of our dread, the impossibility that we cannot get around, God will provide a way through. That's a, that's a deliverance, isn't it? That's a rescue. Let us come across to the book of Daniel. And in the book of Daniel, you have two instances in chapter 3 and in chapter 4 of God's people, and it's a day of trouble. One of them is the story of the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The other is the story of Daniel himself. The story is well known to us. And of course, in both instances, it's a day of trouble because for their faith in their God, they are going to face death itself. Daniel is threatened with being cast into a den of lions. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are being threatened with being cast into a flaming, fiery furnace. Now, how did the Lord intervene in their case? Were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego not cast into the fiery furnace? They were. They were. In other words, God didn't just magically, as it were, if I could use that term in a very loose sense, extinguish the flames. They were there. They were in the fire, really in the fire, literally, physically in the fire. We could say that the day of trouble was, was right there. They're in the fire. But do you notice what happened? When the, godly, the godless king looked down, he says, I thought we put three men into the fire, but I see a fourth. And he's like unto the Son of God. The Lord himself stood with them in the midst of the fire. And you know when he, Nebuchadnezzar said, okay, bring them all, bring them out. So they bring them out. And you know there isn't even a smell of smoke about them. Not only did the Lord stand with them, but the Lord preserved them in the midst of the fire. And I put that to you, isn't that a deliverance? Well, the fire was there, the fire was real, and they were in it. And brethren and sisters, this is something we can say that God always does. No matter what fire you and I find ourselves in, the day of trouble, we can be absolutely certain about this. We're not standing there alone. I will be with him in trouble, says the, says the Lord in Psalm 91 and verse 15. You can underline that in your Bible. Psalm 91 and verse 15, God says, I will be with him in trouble. Is, isn't this something that begins to give our hearts a little bit of encouragement, a little bit of strength, a little bit of hope, that whatever the day of trouble is, and sometimes Satan will try to convince us, you're all on your own, the Lord has left you to your own devices. What a liar Satan is. Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Not even when you're in the middle of the day of trouble. Not even when you're standing in the midst of the fire. I'm going to be right there with you. And then we think of Daniel. 
Likewise, he's threatened. His life is threatened. You pray to this God of Israel, contrary to the command of the king, you're going to be cast into a den of lions, or should I say, yeah, a den of lions. Not a lion's den. There's a difference. The den of lions, the lions were in it. And the lions were real. And the den was real, and Daniel was in the den with the lions. No, he used to sing it. Maybe you know it. Daniel was a man of prayer. Daily he prayed three times, even when they had him cast in the den of lions. In the den, in the den, fear could not alarm him. God shut the lions' mouths. So they could not harm him. Oh, he, he could have stopped them getting into the, the den to start with, but no, he's in the den. There's the day of trouble. Well, what's happening in the day of trouble? Daniel himself said, as he, as he called out to the king, he says, the Lord has sent his angel. The Lord has sent his angel, and the lion's mouths have been closed, and I am unharmed. Right in his day of trouble. Isn't that a deliverance? Friends, this is something that the Lord will do for us. You and I can know this, no matter what the future faces, no matter what the future holds, not only will the Lord stand with us in that day of trouble, whatever it is, but he will strengthen us. He will strengthen us in the midst of the trouble. Psalm 138 and verse 3. In the King James translation, it reads like this. In the day when I cried, you answered me and strengthened me with strength in my soul. The Lord didn't remove the day of trouble. He didn't take away the circumstance. But there he stands with us in the midst of it all. And he strengthens us to face it. And I put it to you. That's a deliverance. I have had much cause in recent days to pray for God's strength. And realizing I have none of my own. And pleading, and it has been brought to me by many who have shared with me encouragement. The words of Psalm are Isaiah 41 and 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. Yes, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Hallelujah. Is it true? Is God deceiving us here? Does make believe? Is this some kind of psychological trickery? Now this is the words of a God who can do all things and a God who cannot lie. And what's the result of it all? We've seen the period, we've seen the prescription, we've seen the promise. And what is the product? What happens when all of that comes to pass? He says, you'll glorify me. You'll glorify me. And you look at the situations that we've, we've, we've drawn from Scripture. Look what happened when, when the Lord delivered the people of Israel at the Red Sea. Look what happened when he delivered the people of Judah from the armies of Zerah, the Ethiopian, under the, at the time of King Jehoshaphat. Look at the time when God visited his people and gave them preservation and strength in the midst of all of their trouble. What did they then respond with? Glorifying him. Glorifying him. Because in order to glorify the Lord for what has happened, you have to recognize that it was the Lord who did it, don't you? Otherwise, you're just going to glory in yourself or something else. But the Lord will not give his glory to another. And he will act in a way and in a fashion that makes it abundantly clear that it is he who has done it. And compel us to say, it's the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes. And when we recognize that it is his work and that he has done it, 
We will give him all of the glory. That's what it means to glorify him. Oh, glory, Lord, and honor to Jesus Christ, our King. He has done all things well, they said of him in, 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 the, in the Gospels. And we will respond how? With thanksgiving, with praise, and with the testimony. And we will tell others of the goodness and the faithfulness of our God. The, uh, the reasons for these days of trouble under the, the sovereignty of God are not always obvious to us. But sometimes they are. I, I read to you in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 where Paul talked about the great uh, extremity of his situation where he said we despaired even of life. And I want to just leave this with you as a final closing thought. He says we felt that we had received the sentence of death. And then he says this. This profound spirit given insight. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Though the situation, Paul says, was of such intensity, such extremity, that we didn't, you know, we despaired of life. We, we, were, we were just in a case of absolute hopelessness. But he said, that's, that's the reason why it happened. That we might rely not on ourselves, but on God, and more importantly, a God who raises the dead. So that in the midst of the day of trouble, among the other reasons, some of which we will not know until we see the Lord face to face. Let's be clear about that. Job was never told by the Lord why he suffered as he did. And when he asked the Lord a whole series of questions, in effect, the Lord said to him, I'm God and you're not. We know that. We know that's all true. But sometimes we recognize that we're put into a situation which is of such an extremity. We're all around, as the hymn writer said, and all around my soul gives way. Our natural proneness to rely on ourselves is something that the Lord is dealing with. Paul well, says this was the reason for this affliction. It was to teach us not to rely on ourselves, but to rely on our God who raises the dead. And the Lord wants to prove to us that he is reliable. Has he not said, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. You will glorify me. Let us grant, God grant us grace to hold on to that. For for not in the day of trouble now, the certainty is that we will be. We will have these times. May God remind us of his constant abiding grace and faithfulness. In the midst of the fire, he will be with us. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your promise. Remind us of this constantly, moment by moment and day by day. Help us, Lord, not to faint in the day of adversity, but to run to the throne of grace and into the arms of a loving Father who will help us and protect us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.